I'm Susan McGinnis with Clean Skies News. I'm talking with Nancy Birdsall. She's president of the Center for Global Development. Nancy, thank you so much for coming by. It's a pleasure. I wanted to ask you, uh, with the G20 here, with the economy and the financial issues and all of the other issues that these 20 ministers need to tackle, how much of an airing do you think the critical climate change issues like uh, developing a financing mechanism for the industrialized countries to give support to the developing nations, um, how much airing of the major issues like that do you think will be had here in just two days? I don't think very much. I think the critical point is that the G20 leaders, while they're here, deal at least with starting a process, particularly on who and how will any climate change accord be implemented. I don't think they're going to go into details. I don't think they want to upstage the official negotiating process. Uh, in the direction of Copenhagen. There was the discussion yesterday at the United Nations on the climate issues. So I think at this meeting they'll concentrate on the immediate crisis, uh, the financial crisis. What we're hoping and what many development and environmental advocates are hoping is that they'll put a down payment on how to think through in the next year or two the you know, climate change issue. Down payment on thinking through and I mean, so you don't really see a framework for this kind of financial mechanism uh, happening. I mean these are the finance guys and we're ten weeks away from Copenhagen. Exactly. I mean you have a good point. Uh, the fact is that the financing mechanism needs to be discussed in the context of the larger negotiation and many of the developing countries that are members of the G20 are nervous about talking about the financing mechanism independent of the overall negotiation. They're also concerned that in the G20 context, the financing mechanism to be discussed would possibly concentrate on existing institutions like the World Bank and the other multilateral development banks, and they don't want the financing arrangements to fall into the same trap of what you could consider now the way foreign aid is managed, which is a little bit unforgiving, uh, a little bit in, a very ineffective, and in some ways mm, lacks the partnership quality. It, it's treated too much as charity and not enough as a deal, a business-like arrangement. Well, then let me ask you this. How, how important is at least a framework, framework for such a financing mechanism to success in, in building a successor to Kyoto? Absolutely. I think in the larger sense there's financing issues, there's verification issues, there's compliance issues. There are a whole set of issues that institutions need to take on, that the G20 members and indeed the UN can't take on. Um, the UN is, is it's hard on the financing for the UN to do it. They don't have very much implementation right. capacity. And, and you've made recommendations to other institu world institutions like the, the World Bank, the IMF, and the World Trade Organization. Exactly. What role, what, what role do you want them to play that they're not playing now? Well, what I, my view is, and this is what I've spoken about in the last few weeks, that we need an institution or a set of institutions that have both effectiveness, technical and financial capacity, and legitimacy, that they represent all of the major emitting countries and the poorest countries who need to have resources to adapt to climate change. We don't really have that institution now. We have the UN, which is legitimate, seen as legitimate and highly representative, but doesn't have the technical and financial capacity. We have the World Bank, which has the capacity, but doesn't have the legitimacy. So what the G20 leaders could do, even at this meeting in Pittsburgh, is begin to talk about and set plans for deciding it between now and their next meeting, what are the tasks that need to be accomplished and which institutions should take them on. And financing will be a big part of that. Are you, are you happy with the progress that you've seen in these areas so far or are you frustrated? I mean, it sounds to me like there's such a long road to go. I mean, this is not happening in Copenhagen, by Copenhagen. I'm frustrated about the lack of discussion of how any accord will be implemented. Why? because it could be that talking now about who and how will certain functions be carried out would actually create some common ground and some goodwill that could enhance the discussion of the accord itself. For example, it's hard to believe that the U.S. Congress is going to sign, sign on to an arrangement where they're not convinced that what other countries do can be 
monitored and verified. Right. It's hard to convince. It's hard to imagine that China and India and Brazil will sign on to agreements where they don't have a third party disinterested, us uh, saying auditing, indeed overseeing uh, commitments that the United States makes. So we should really be seeing um, uh, Pittsburgh and you know other uh, other events on the run up to Copenhagen and Copenhagen now as just one uh, another another step on the road. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, with with a focus not on the negotiation per se, but on how it will be implemented. I mean, so many leaders are talking about how the you know that the timetable is critical, that the time frame is critical, and just sound, it sounds like it's going to be be quite a while. Do you see these ministers talking about other issues like? Um, uh, you know, really uh, green stimulus and green and green investment, and talking about uh, funding for adaptation and mitigation for these countries at the same time. And so many of these ministers are are here to talk about exit strategies from what they've already committed. Well, I think in the background there is a lot of thinking about adaptation and the amounts, but they're not. I doubt they're going to make a big announcement on that. Um, um, you had another issue, and now I forgot it. That um, I wanted to well, so many to of them are here talking about pulling back and get, getting out of this, the uh, the commitments that they've they've made financially. No, um, are they going to be able to? Are, are those other issues coming to the table? You know, talking about funding for green investment, clean technology. Oh, that's it. Yes, <laughs> I think that will be repeated. The idea. This is really a good thing that the stimulus packages can be directed to green investments, and I, I think there's a good chance that because of what the president of China said yesterday at, at the United Nations, that, s that the U.S. and some of the other developed countries will pick up in a, in a sort of healthy sense of competitiveness that we should be investing lots in clean energy, both because it can contribute dramatically to reducing emissions, but also because it can create jobs. It's a kind of public investment over the next years that we need anyway um, in the stimulus sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you said recently that, f that for G20 success, these ministers need to prepare for the next crisis. And I think you're talking about the risk to the developing countries? That's right. But tell us about Well, that. we don't know what the next crisis is, but uh, we can be sure, we don't know which of <laughs> several different crises might occur. Right. But we certainly do know that the climate change uh, problem will create crisis conditions in the developing world. Countries like India, uh, with business as usual emissions, would see a 40 percent reduction in agricultural production over the next 60 or 70 years. Uh, the sea level rise is a disaster for the people of Bangladesh. We're talking about millions and millions of people. The migratory movements that will be pushed are a because of, say, drought are a national security issue for the U.S. So it's not one big obvious financial crisis, right. uh, or like today's financial crisis, but we, we can foresee that next crisis, and there are likely to be others that particularly in the developing world that everybody's these talking about them I'm just uh, I'm not sure they're coming to a, you know coming to agreements on them so I, I guess um, you have tempered optimism about what could be accomplished in December I have tempered op optimism on December and in part because there now exists a G20 which is more inclusive it does represent more countries uh, more than 80 percent of the emissions come from the 20 countries that are officially in that club that's a big step in the right direction from the G7, and I think the leadership that this administration and our president can take, uh, by that President Bush took by convening the heads of government, and President Obama is taking by at least saying we're going to make a commitment on climate change through the G20 in a world that is multipolar, where we can't do it alone. That's important. That's something to be optimistic mm, that's about. That's right. All right. <laughs> On that optimistic note, Nancy Bertzel, Center for, Center for Global Development, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I'm Susan McGinnis, Clean Skies News.